Hi guys, so uh, today we'll talk about distributed hash tables and this is a <laughs> this is kind of a topic I have some history with. So one of my uh, one of the people on my committee was one of the guys or the main author I guess behind uh, Tapestry and um, he got to he got his uh, job at UCSB uh, based on his work on distributed hash tables and then when he got there the whole research area kind of died away <laughs> like it, people started thinking of this solved problem and so in spite of doing some of the coolest work in this area he ended up needing to switch his lab to working on something else um, my other story with this is that when I was taking the distributed systems course in grad school um, our programming assignment was to implement uh, cord in a way to that that uh, provably correctly handles failures, which uh, turns out it's not really possible. At least people don't know that it is, and no one seems to be able to do it correctly. So it was kind of an impossible, impossible project, except no one told us about it. So countless hours trying to figure this out, and trust me, madness lies that way. So <laughs> uh, it's kind of a fun topic anyway, though. It, there's some pretty cool tools based on distributed hash tables, and it's. Uh, I think one of the most uh, elegant solutions in computer science, especially in distributed systems. So, all right. If we talk about the distributed hash table, I kind of mentioned it in the last lecture a little bit, but a bit more formally, um, oop, looks like my text got cut off. Not cool. Uh, let's put this in the background. Uh, uh, all right, this is taking too long. So, um, <laughs> What we have is a ring of IDs. And so those IDs go from uh, zero, let me get my pointer. Uh, those IDs go from zero to some number, depending on how many bits you have to store. So if your IDs are stored in 128-bit numbers, then you go from zero to two to, two to the 28 minus one. And so you can hash anything into this ring. You can hash object IDs, which will fall, which, whose hash will fall somewhere on this ring. Or you can hash node IDs, maybe by hashing the IP address, and those nodes will also fall onto this ring. All right, so no matter what set of objects and node IDs you have, this is all going to organize itself into this nice ring, and everything is going to have a globally unique identifier. Okay? So to join this network you would uh, compute your uh, global ID from public key or uh, IP address in some cases um, and then you would publish values so you have some file that you want to upload and you would publish it at its uh, global ID value so this makes it um, a bit tricky for some applications because you don't really necessarily want to hash like a song like the actual value of the mp3 bytes but maybe the title of the song right so coming up with the value of an object to to hash it can be a little bit tricky right and then when you fetch it well you want to pass in the id but then you actually want to get the value meaning the bytes of the file not the title of the song okay so there's a little bit of work that has to get done here to make this useful and the basic idea behind this maybe i should back up a sec is to allow people to find objects in a distributed system. So um, this is a little bit out of order, I realize, but I guess next, next lecture I'll talk about, un uh, about unstructured peer-to-peers and how much of a pain it is to find stuff in those. Um, so that's what we wanna do. We wanna uh, quickly find named objects in a distributed system. Basically, the question is who has the data um, so that I can contact them and fetch it. All right, so the way this uh, searching works is you can think of it as uh, different nodes on this ring have some set of pointers, okay, two neighboring nodes, and then let's say this node is the node that actually has the object hashed to D46A1C, and so this node is responsible for storing all the objects that hash to between its hash and the previous node's hash. So if this node here has links to 
up to four nodes uh, next to it, you can find this object by saying, okay, I want to find this hash and it happens to be less than the hashes of the objects I know on the ring. So I'm going to forward the, re the request into the node that's furthest away from me in my routing table. And this node will do the same, and this node will do the same, and this node will do the same. And then this node says, oh, I don't need to go to the furthest node. I know that this is less than the next node, uh, but more than this node in my routing table. So I'm going to forward the request to the node right before it. And now this node says, oh, okay, this ID is actually within what I'm storing. I can now return that value um, to here. Okay, so we kind of forward requests um, using this routing table and because everyone has pointers, you can eventually walk around the circle to find the right node. Okay. Um, now, to make this faster, what we want is to impose a certain structure onto the routing table. Okay, so each node is going to have a link to nodes that are halfway across the ring and then a quarter across the ring and then less and less and less. Okay, so we can make these big hops initially, but then when we get to this node, we don't need to go halfway around the ring, we don't need to go a quarter around the ring, we can go an eighth around the ring and then less and less. Okay, so we get to the node in uh, a smaller number of hops, specifically in uh, page three in log base 16 of n, n being the number of nodes. Okay, and so here's an example of a, of a table where each node doesn't have links to like halfway across or quarter across. It actually has a link to a node in its routing table for each of the 16 numbers uh, in hexadecimal. That's why it's base 16. Okay, so if I want to find um, something, I can if it's between two and three, I can forward it to the IP address of the node that I have in my table under two and whatever mapping, okay? Um, or I can kind of drill deeper into the table as I get closer and say, oh, the key I'm looking for actually starts with six and that's relatively close to me. And so I have an expanded table for everything that starts with six from six zero to six F, right? And so um, you have more accurate resolution of the, of the routing table as you get closer and closer to um, kind of your own ID, right? So if my ID he's, here starts with uh, 65A0, okay, I don't have any more routing table, which means I'm going to be responsible for everything between uh, 65A1, sorry, and 65A2 in this case. Um, so let's see what's happening here. So we have 65A1FC, so we can go uh, 65A1FC. Okay, so what's happening here is we're looking for D46A1C. Okay, so we're starting at this node. So we can go to 64D, D, 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 D. Okay, so we have something starting with D. Okay, great. So under this table, we're going to have a link to some IP and that's going to be this node. Then this guy is searching for um, D461A and his table would be, instead of being expanded in this position, it would be expanded in this position where the second row of the table starts with all Ds. Okay. So if you have this type of ring and let's say in our system we have a failure, how would you handle this? Well, there's a few things that would have to happen. First, uh, to handle failures, multiple nodes would need to have storage of the same key, right? Because if each key is only stored at one node, then you're gonna lose the keys um, if a node, you're gonna lose some keys if a node goes away, right? So what happens is that this node is responsible for not just four keys between it and the previous node, but between it and maybe some number of other nodes, okay? So there's some amount of overlap. So if this node goes away, there are other nodes um, on this side of the ring that also have storage of those keys and they can serve those requests, okay? When a node fails, you also need to update the routing tables, right? And so 
this is kind of the, the problem that I had to solve in my distributed systems class where you come up with some mechanism that, that does it in a uh, as correct way as possible, right? And so um, you can have, you can notice node failure and try to reconstruct the routing tables. Um, you can have some redundancy in the routing tables to kind of limit the amount of reconstruction you have to do. Um, ultimately, to the best of my knowledge, all these mechanisms are going to be probabilistic. Okay, Prob and by probabilistic, I mean you can only handle so many failures, right? So maybe to drill this, to drill into this a little bit deeper, what matters is the rate at which the nodes are failing versus the rate at which you can reconstruct the routing table, right? Or reconstruct enough replication of the keys, right? So if one node drops and now your keys are only two replicated instead of three replicated, well, then you have to bring another node uh, into the replication of those keys, right? So there is some, the mechanism you're going to build is going to have some rate of recovery and that has to be faster than your rate of failure, right? And then if your failures are localized, well then uh, your recovery mechanism has to be fast enough to handle localized failures, right? And, and kind of proving that that's correct is difficult because <laughs> you can't really uh, guarantee that failures are gonna happen at some uh, polite rate, right? So, um, all right, so under page three, you have this locality-based uh, routing table construction, which is kind of cool. You have some hash for your, for your node, and you know, that, not, that node should be here in the ring, but maybe the only node you know of is over here, right? So if you're joining on this node, you would first do this routing thing to kind of find nodes that are nearby to where you need to be. And then you would build your routing table by first borrowing the table from them, right? So um, I would maybe contact this node and try to get um, the first level of my routing table, right? And then I would drill into some node in my routing table, like let's say here under 6.5, I would contact this node and I would get this part of the routing table. Okay. Um, and so when you when you're looking at the performance of this, what people notice that does is that there is a stretch, a route stretch of about 30 to 50 percent, meaning that if I'm trying to get he from here to here, there is some path through the network just based on routing that's going to get me here, right? But I'm not routing through the internet using IP. I need to route at the application layer through this ring. And so this path is going to be about 30, 50% longer than a direct path, right? So it's not great, but it's also not terrible, right? This is kind of bounded. Um, I already mentioned that multiple objects are responsible for, um, for the same object ID to kind of prevent from geographic failures. We're going to distribute node IDs uh, geographically, right? Which also, causes this problem where, you know, maybe going from America to China, then to Vietnam, then back to Europe to get to, to, get to this location. Um, and so you have a bit of a route stretch there as well, or that's where the route stretch comes from. Um, what else do we want to say? What else do we want to say? Um, okay, so pros of this is that it self-organizes nicely. Uh, code can also break up cluster data. Um, yeah. Um, and then on the, on the con side, as I mentioned, there is no guarantee of finding the piece of data even though it exists in the ring, right? So there's some percentage of, of failures in these, in these systems. So um, this is a good example of you, of you kind of sacrificing consistency um, for uh, availability, right? So these, these things are very available, it's hard to bring them down because they're so replicated and randomized, but there is some sort of failures where, um, well, actually you're not, you're not sacrificing consistency. I guess if you get the data, it's consistent. Uh, you're sacrificing availability, right? So usually we've seen consistency uh, being sacrificed. Here's availability sacrificed, right? And of course, you're gonna have the route stretch um, as opposed to kind of IP routing, right? And so, um, 
tapestry solves this problem of your data being placed far, far away, right? We want to be able to geographically cluster data, um, but still we want to be able to have this robust routing structure to, to find where that data is, right? So tapestry uh, separates data storage from location. And so the way it works is you have a distributed hash table. Here's another view of it, right? It's just a set of IDs and when you route, you jump from one ID to another according to what's in your routing table, right? So instead of drawing the nodes in a ring, you could kind of forget about the structure of the logical, of the logical ring in the network, place the nodes wherever, but then the logical ring kind of lives over this where these are the hops through it, all right? So let's say that we want to um, introduce some objects into this, right? you could have the same object be replicated on nodes in different areas, such that I can find nodes that are uh, closest to me potentially, right? So when I, when I publish the data, right, I'm going to publish it by sending it uh, to the root node, which happens to be this, for the ID of the object that I'm trying to place. Okay, so 4378 would live on node 4388. Now, the difference is that this data isn't actually stored at this node. All this node does, it stores the location of where the data is in the network on what nodes, okay? So 4377 would store the fact that Phil's books are on 4288 and AA93, okay? So when you're trying to uh, find this object, let's say we want to download it from this node here, okay? We would first go to root, and then root would be able to say, oh, your closest replica is here. And it could use something similar to DNS to kind of find closest things, or you know, maybe geolocation on IP addresses, you can figure out that this is the closest replica to you, right? You could get both locations and yourself find the closest one, right? So then I would actually, you know, maybe forward data through the network to this node here. Right? Um, the nice thing about the system is if I'm querying this, I might just get to this node and because the publishing path of Phil's book when I was sending it to root node went was being routed through 4361, 4361 also no knows that there's a replica here and it could direct you to it right away. Right? And then some node here could be directed to a closer replica which is over here. Right? So you can either get both IDs from the root or you can get one from closer to you in the network um, and then be able to access it more directly, right? So it's kind of a nice elegant result of separating location from, uh, from the routing. Okay, so where is this stuff used? Well, there are some pretty cool projects that were built on this, um, but there's some performance problems with these things that that with distributed hash tables that makes them um, not suitable for, for all environments. Um, and also with the advent of cloud computing, distributed storage kind of went a different route, right? People aren't trying necessarily to store data in the edge of the network. Um, they are storing it in giant data centers and that's just a much easier way to build distributed services. Right, but for certain applications, distributed hash tables are great. And as we've seen already, um, oh, actually we haven't talked about it yet, but um, uh, actually Ethereum uses a distributed hash table underneath um, to route data. So um, when data has to be stored at the edge, DHDs are the thing to use, okay? So one of the cool projects that came out based on distributed hash tables out of Microsoft Research in 2002 was Squirrel. And Squirrel was a, uh, basically a web cache. So inside networks, inside organizations, um, like for example at MSU, we would have a web cache such that people requesting the same objects over and over again don't need to use our MSU's outgoing internet connection. Those objects can be cached inside our network and serve to people internally. The idea is that within an organization there's some overlap of what everyone's looking at, right? Probably most people are looking uh, more people are looking at Twitter than looking at Weibo from within MSU, right? And so the idea behind Squirrel is, is instead of 
spending organizations spending the money to deploy a separate um, web cache, we can actually store this web data on each other's computers. So use the storage of end computers as the cache. And the question then is how to find the objects. Well, the objects are already well named. Each of them is identified by a URL. And so that becomes the key. And so using Squirrel, we can uh, route to a computer in the local area network that has the object that we want to download. Okay. And so they've seen, they've shown that you have some hit rate. Um, um, sorry, the graph shows um, external bandwidth. So basically, when you don't have objects locally, you have to go outside of the network to download the stuff you need. <coughs> Excuse me. And so without a web cache, you're sending this much data out of your network. And with a centralized cache, you'd be sending out substantially less, saving this bandwidth. All right. And so if we're using home store, um, where data is stored on, on local machines, the more of the data that is stored here is kind of the amount of data stored per node, the less of your web traffic will be leaving your um, organization. Um, another project that I think is super cool is Ocean Store, where people try to build a uh, distributed file system based on a uh, distributed hash table. The challenge with file systems is that you're not just storing some named files, you also need to be able to modify them. But replacing a whole file, if we're only changing a few bits, is very wasteful. And so um, Ocean Store figured out how to uh, store data inside uh, in, in a distributed matter where when we need to replace some bytes, we don't need to replace the whole file. The way they're doing it is they're storing the object or some named file in a root block, okay? But then instead of storing the whole file at a particular node, they're storing pointers to other objects. Okay, so this file can be broken down into these three blocks and then each of these blocks can be mapped to some node and then these indirect blocks have mappings to actual data blocks. So what's stored in the network are these root blocks and indirect blocks and then eventually they point to actual data blocks where data is stored. Okay, so this file maps to these indirect blocks and then the, the actual file is composed of bytes stored in this data block. Now, when you are changing the file, so you have the same file name, but you, file name, but you have a new version of it, okay? What you see is that these virtual blocks map to different locations, okay? So the first one maps to this version and these actual data blocks, okay? But the second block maps to a new virtual block, and then some of the virtual block maps back to here, but ver bytes or chunks of bytes D6 and D7 have been changed, and so those mappings are stored here, okay? So now in your network, you have data blocks D1 through D7, and then D6 prime and D7 prime, okay? So you can still look at all versions of the file, but when you're making a change, all we need to override is um, a small set of bytes, right? So that's basically by inserting these new bytes into the distributed hash table. Um, so this is pretty cool. Um, it works okay on LANs, obviously not as well as a centralized system, but doesn't work very well at all on wide area networks just because of network latencies involved in resolving the links between the different blocks. I still think this is very elegant and uh, I've been kicking around some ideas of how to use this for, um, for blockchain, but um, uh, just kind of no time to take advantage of this yet. Um, so anyway, it's a bit short and sweet today. Hope you guys enjoyed it and I will talk to you on Friday. Cheers.